Welcome to Reality TV. I'm Raymond Bakari. This episode is continuing my coverage of the special election for Rhode Island's first congressional district to replace former Congressman David Cicilline. One of those candidates joining me today is State Representative Stephen Casey, who represents Rhode Island House District 50, a seat he first won in 2012. Rep Casey, how are you today? Good morning, Ray. I'm, I'm doing just fine. How are you? I'm doing great, and it's a pleasure to have you on. My first thank question you. is, why do you want to represent Rhode Island in Congress? Uh, well, thank you. Um, I got to I'm going to tell you that as a 17 year firefighter, uh, I, you know, I've witnessed firsthand uh, how people live in Rhode Island and the experiences they face and sometimes the difficult situations that they uh, that they they face. And uh, I'm one of those people that when the bell goes off, I'm not going to check your voter registration. I'm the person that's going to come and uh, try to help you out. So um, as an Eagle Scout and a Freemason, um, I, I have certain tenants that I live by. They're basically trustworthy, honesty, loyalty. And uh, with those tenants, um, that's how I guide my life and self-governance. But as well, that's how I deal with things on a political level. Um, my bipartisan political track record uh, at the state house, you know, I've been able to bring groups together, find consensus and, and really make a difference in the lives of Rhode Islanders. Um, I believe we need some strong, strong leadership here in Rhode Island. I have 10 years of experience at the state house. Uh, most recent, well, in, in 2021, I handled the Health and Human Services Committee as the chairman during the COVID-19 pandemic. And now uh, this uh, this year, the speaker has uh, given me the responsibility of the Municipal Government and Housing Committee. Um, and those are two things that really can highlight my leadership abilities here at the State House. Um, my decision to run for office, though, was based upon uh, you know, I first decided at the end of March, there was only a few candidates in the race, but I, I felt that those people did not have the views that I had and did not represent me and my community. So I said, this is the opportunity and this is the time to do that. And I would like to do that and represent all of Rhode Island uh, on a national level. You kind of touched upon it a bit in that in that toward the end of that answer, but I usually like, usually like to ask the candidates running in this primary, what differentiates them from the other candidates because there's going to be a total of 12 on that Democratic primary ballot. So how do you differ from the 11 other Democrats running for the seat? Well, I believe I have uh, much more moderate views. And I think that um, the ability for me to bring groups together, and I'll give you an example. I've received, uh, I've received endorsements from uh, a few of the unions, from the Rhode Island uh, Association of Firefighters, the International Association of Firefighters, the Rhode Island Brotherhood of Correction Officers, and the State Fraternal Order of Police. But I've also received and I and I enjoy great support from the business community as well. And it's very rare. I don't think it's ever happened that, that a union employee or a union candidate has received support from the business community. And I think that's because of the way I look at things. Uh, I like to call it the 50,000 foot view. Um, there's a way, you know, normally those two entities are fighting amongst each other. Uh, but there's a way to have businesses survive and have union union wages and good jobs and have everybody come together to meet on the level at the table so that everybody can survive and it's going to be a better better situation for everybody. And I think that I'm the person that can do that. It's the same type of thing with uh, politics as it is right now. We're very polarized. Um, we have people that are uh, very progressive and very conservative and those people don't even talk to each other. And I think what we need to do is we need to be able to come together on those issues that we know we can agree on and work together on those things. And then maybe we can get into a better situation and bring everybody back more uh, to 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 an agreement and more to the towards the center. And that's where my my moderate beliefs will will bring us. Now, looking at some policies and your policy positions, one topic that we covered in the recent CD1 forum that we had you part of that Ryan Lukowicz and I organized was addressing the issue of gun violence. Some yep. folks watching this may have not watched that yet, but when we asked you what policies you would support to address that issue. You focused on the aspects of mental health and having SROs in schools, uh, school resource school resource officers. Um, can you talk a little more about your philosophy on this issue? Well, I think first of all, um, part of part of the uh, part of the gun violence issue is about uh, the prevalence of illegal firearms on the streets. And we really need to, to concentrate and do a lot to take illegal firearms off the streets. These are illegally obtained. These are owned by gang members. Uh, they're guns without serial numbers and those type of things. Um, so President Biden uh, you know, passed a, a bipartisan legislation with the Safer Communities Act. We're putting more, uh, more officers on the streets. We're training officers better. 
uh, to handle uh, to handle situations. I think what we also have, and and part of that program will also focus on mental health, uh, and mental health and counseling for for children, students, and we have a we have a real mental health issue in the United States as it is. And part of that, uh, you know, when you're talking about gun violence, yes, there's a there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of illegal firearms on the streets, but we're talking about people who we're talking about school shootings and we're talking about uh, acts of violence in a, in a public place. People who have, who are sane do not commit these acts of violence. So we need to really focus on what is it that's causing this? What is it that's causing these things? And we need to focus on trying to, trying to uh, create a better situation uh, in general, in the, in the public. And one of the big ticket items we highlighted that national Democrats want to pass in that forum was the national assault weapons ban. You were one of the candidates who weren't too keen on having that pass on the national level. And you cited the in Rhode Island's case, and I'm assuming this was a similar reason why for the national is the language of these bills. So what parts of this, these kind of bills language are you most concerned with? Well, I think the, the issues are with, uh, you, you're talking about, uh, semi-automatic firearm, semi-automatic weapon. Uh, when you're gonna get into the details of it and it's very difficult to do that in a very short period of time, but uh, an, ass an assault weapon is a submachine gun, which is an automatic firing weapon. Those are completely illegal right now. A semi-automatic weapon, whether it's a pistol or an AR-15 platform rifle is the same act, absolute operation. You have one trigger pull and one fire. Um, the actual aesthetics of the of the piece of, of the gun itself, um, they look like a machine gun, um, and that's really all it. That's really the only difference. So we're talking about um, banning something that is very much the same as a as a semi-automatic uh, pistol, only because only because it looks dangerous. So in terms of language, that distinction is what you would want to be put in the bill? Well, they, you know, in terms of the language, I think we need to, I think, I think something might need to be developed, but, but that particular, that particular weapon is the same as a semi-automatic pistol. So if you're talking about banning that type of particular weapon, now you're talking about banning all, all guns, and then you, you have no opportunity to protect yourself in your home. Before we move on from this topic, I do want to ask you about your rating from the NRA because it's it's something that's probably going to be a topic of conversation. You know, when ask when uh, folks try to differentiate your views on this issue versus other folks' view on this issue in that primary. Last I checked, it was ninety two percent out of one hundred in twenty twenty two. That might be a concern for some voters in this primary. You know, you touched upon it a bit. Voters are more polarized now, especially in primary elections. So, what do you say to those who may be concerned about that NRA rating you have? Well, I, I've always voted for common sense gun legislation, and that's probably why they have me at a 92 and not at uh, you know well over 100. Um, there are things that there are things that we have passed in the House of Representatives, like the banning of bump stocks and those those type of things, that made sense. And those are the things that the banning of ghost guns that those things make sense. Those are the things that I voted for. Um, some of the legislation that we had in the House of Representatives did not make sense to me. There were I there were options and things that would have changed that for me um, and those were not considered i offered amendments to legislation and those weren't considered either and in congress so i think you, my rating my sorry go ahead go ahead it, it i think like, my rating my rating speaks for itself so in congress if these kinds of bills like banning assault national assault weapons uh makes it to the floor would you try to offer amendments to make sure that your concerns are addressed Yes, I would. And if we're if we if the if the term is if the term the terminology of the language is correct, then then I wouldn't have a problem with it. But we need to we need to look at we need to look at language and make sure that we're not creating or making regular ordinary law abiding citizens criminals for owning uh, a handgun or or a semi automatic rifle uh, just because of the way that it looks. That's the problem. Got it. We also covered the economy in that forum, but that one was more open forum. And I want to ask you specific questions. Um, one of them, uh, actually relating to what you had mentioned in that forum, you talked about the blue economy in Rhode Island, and that's a big topic here. Um, what, uh, you know, actually, wait, that was a follow up. My apologies. Um, I want to talk about the cost of living first. Um, so the cost of living, despite inflation going down compared to this time last year, the cost of living is still high. Um, in Congress, what efforts would you support to reduce the cost of living? Well, I'd like to I'd like to be able to 
make it easier for all, all Americans to live an easier life. Uh, I think we've had some severe uh, issues with supply chain and all of those things since COVID. And it seems to me that no matter what we do, uh, the price of the price of whatever we need is going up. Um, for example, we used to eat lunch at the fire station for five dollars a meal. Now we can't do it for less than seven. Um, so everybody is feeling that squeeze. I think we need to figure out what are the what are those particular causes that's making making this. And, and if it's and if it's just corporate profit, then that's a shame. And we need to figure out how to change that. Um, so we need to figure out what's happening. Um, I think there are a lot of different issues that can be addressed. And now looking at that follow-up I had, which is the, the blue economy topic, that could be a way to grow Rhode Island's economy. I know Congress is more of a federal level, but you have the probably the opportunity to bring federal resources to increase Rhode Island's blue economy. Do you have any specific ideas how you would go about that in Congress? Well, we do have the opportunity. We know that there's going to be, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, having a wind farm built, uh, you know, wind farms built up along up and down the East Coast. So I think that's a very good opportunity. Um, I think I think there are some uh, issues that we need to be careful of the sustainability of that, the failure rate of of uh, of wind turbines and those type of things. So we need to we need to gently take an opportunity, but to bring business here into Rhode Island because we have so much shore access, we have an opportunity to 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 help sustain that type of uh, that type of economy and those type of projects. I think there's going to be some very good opportunity for Rhode Island companies to do that. Are there any specific opportunities you have in mind or any incentives? Um, well, there's it, what, what's nice is we, we have a few we have a few uh, we have a few businesses that are local here in uh, in the uh, Quonset area that are uh, are places where we can uh, maintain uh, that we'll, we will be able to maintain uh, those those particular projects that are happening, the building of the wind farms and the main maintenance of the actual uh, turbines themselves. So we're going to have an opportunity to bring more business to hire and have more jobs in the Quonset area. Um, I think it's going to be a very good opportunity for Rhode Islanders in the in the long run. And sticking with the local aspect of it, uh, Rhode Island was ranked 45th in the top states for business in 2023. Um, I believe the ranking was listed in July by uh, CNBC. Um, yep. Like those projects and opportunities you mentioned, that could possibly help the state's business friendly friendliness. But are there any other ways that you think of that could fix Rhode Island's ranking? Well, I think there are uh, issues. I mean, I was able to attend World Trade Day back in uh, back in uh, the spring uh, at Bryant University, and you know there are a lot of companies that are in that are involved and interested in exporting. Um, we need to be we need to be able to make sure that. Um, there's going to be an opportunity for that to happen. Um, there's also 155,000 businesses here in Rhode Island that are small businesses that the majority of people that live in Rhode Island act are actually employed by. Um, I think we need to kind of take a look at the tax structure of, of those type of things and make it easier for those businesses to continue to survive. Um, everybody took a major hit during COVID. Um, you know, we had uh, we had the PPP. Uh, money that was that was sent out to allow businesses to stay open to pay their employees, uh, but then we had an, a situation where the state wanted to tax that PPP money as income. Um, I was the only candidate of all those folk, uh, of all the folks that are here that actually stood with the business community uh, to to protest the PPP tax uh, because it was just a completely unfair. Uh, we're trying to we're trying to help service businesses survive. And then we're trying to take take money from them on the back end. It was really a, a tough situation. And I, I gained a lot of respect from the business community for that. Um, and, and these are the things that, you know, my opponents haven't done. Another concern that I also like to ask folks running for Congress about, especially while we're talking about the economy, is the national debt. It's currently at 32 trillion and counting, and it's not only going to affect my generation, but a few after that. How would you contribute to addressing that issue as a congressperson? Well, I think we do need to address that. Um, you know, we can't have we can't always have so many bills to pay. But we, you know, we just had a situation where uh, there was a question of increasing the debt ceiling. Uh, we certainly can't go into a default either. We have to pay our bills. If we don't, if we don't do that, if we did not increase the the, the debt ceiling, then we would essentially crash the economy. And I think that would be completely irresponsible. Uh, some of my opponents have had opinions on that, and and some of them have said, okay, well, let's just default. And I think that's completely irresponsible. Um, it's like saying, okay, just take my house. I'm done. You know, go ahead and foreclose on my house. Cause I, cause I don't want to pay anymore. And that's completely irresponsible. I think we need to be careful 
Um, we need to, we need to possibly address our spending in different ways. Uh, we can look at ways to reduce in different areas. Any specific areas in mind? I know, for example, some folks say let's reduce the military budget. And then when you go on the Republican side, they talk about Social Security and Medicare, which is like a big no, no for Democratic uh, primary voters. Right. Right. Uh, well, some of the military budget can be looked at, but we have to be careful uh, with that as well. Um, my concern, I have I have a major concern with uh, some of the foreign aid that we send and how we spend that money and, you know, how that money is accounted for and where does it go? Uh, and for me, um, I, I have a I have a difficult time seeing money being spent overseas. Yes, we have to preserve democracy. I, th I think we should and, and preserve and promote de democracy. Um, but we also need to take a, take an idea. And I think I have an I, my idea would be to have a a matching fund plan where whatever we're going to send overseas, however many many billions of dollars we're going to do, let's let's have a matching fund and take 10 percent every time we send foreign aid. Let's take 10 percent of that money and let's address things at home here with our homelessness, with substance use disorder, with our veterans who are underserved and with our populations that are underserved. I think that's a that would be a, a good use of spending money. I have a couple of lightning round questions to get through some topics quickly, just to cool things down a bit as well. Are you in favor of or opposed to statehood for Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico? Uh, I would be opposed to that. Banning members of Congress from trading stocks, would you support or oppose that idea? Um, I, I think it needs to be looked at. Um, I, 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 I suppose I can support that. Do you support President Biden's re-election bid? Um, right now, I can't answer that question. He's not supporting my election bids right now, so we'll, we'll figure that out when we get there. So undecided for that primary? Yes. Got it. And lastly, for lightning round, what is one committee that you would like to be on if elected to Congress? Uh, well, I think the House Ways and Means Committee or the Appropriations Committee would be great. And obviously, as a freshman, that's probably not going to happen. So I think uh, given the work that I've done in health and human services and the veterans uh, in the veterans community, I think that I'd like to be involved with both of those. All right. Moving on from lightning round, reproductive rights, that's still going to be one of the biggest issues in this primary and even in the general election and even in the election cycle after that. Um, yep. For those who may have not watched that forum, do you consider yourself pro-life or pro-choice? I am pro-life personally. I was born and raised Catholic. I'm an Eagle Scout first responder. Um, I've given birth to premature children. I've helped assist in pre birth of premature children in a rescue. Um, I am personally pro-life. But I am also a constitutionalist, and I believe in the Constitution, and I believe a woman has a right to make those decisions with her doctor. Um, I am not equipped to make that decision for a woman, and so I will leave that with, with women and so their legis doctors and their families. Legislatively speaking, you would favor codifying Roe on the federal level? I will not overturn Roe v. Wade. I would codify Roe v. Wade if, if, uh, you know, if that comes up. And as you know, in Rhode Island, the next step was taken, which was passing the EACA. There's eagerness yep. from Democrats to do that federally, which would require the repealing of the Hyde Amendment. Where do you stand in that conversation? Um, I have felt that that the uh, taxpayer abortion, uh, I would be I would be against that, and I was against that here at the state house uh, in the state here. So you you would uh, keep the Hyde Amendment, just to clarify? Yes. Got it. And speaking of your voting record in Rhode Island, you did vote against the EACA, as you mentioned. But also, to my understanding, you didn't vote in favor of that 2019 Reproductive Privacy Act either. That may concern Democrats in this primary who want someone that's 100 percent unapologetically pro-choice. Should voters be concerned with your record on that issue? Well, I think what I think what people need to understand is, uh, as you as you as you mentioned, um, I voted the same way uh, since I've been here. I stand on my principles and just to get a few votes to run for Congress, um, I'm not going to change my principles in that way. Um, I'm, I'm a, a man of honor and loyalty and um, I, I don't change. I'm not going to change who I am and how I am when I get to Congress. I do want to just uh, pin that down a bit, though, because the 2019 bill is similar to the Roe v. Wade codifying federally. So is, has your stance changed then? Well, in for my situation, like I said, I'm not going to overturn Roe versus Wade. Okay, and but I am personally against abortion myself. Got it. Um, this one's more of a political topic, uh, not really policy oriented, and you've probably read it on the news and heard about it on talk radio over these past couple of weeks. Lieutenant Governor Matos's <laughs> signature scandal. Um, she'll still be on the ballot because the BOE isn't going to audit every signature and the overseas ballots have already been sent out. Um, 
What are your thoughts on this issue? It's uh, you know, it's quite quite the story. Well, it's an unfortunate situation that somebody with with uh, you know her, her level of political experience uh, would have to go out and pay people to actually uh, to get signatures. Um, I spent a lot of time with my dad at the supermarket, standing out in front of the supermarket and walking out in public and getting our signatures. Um, so I don't understand why this is such a this was such a problem. Um, but I too I do truly believe that. Um, if you're running a campaign, then the buck stops here and, you know, you're responsible for everything that happens in your campaign. Um, I don't understand uh, the situation, why uh, the Board of Elections will not or has not, you know, taken taken a, a more of a stand with that. But at this point, uh, I'm not going to throw rocks at people and, and uh, you know, I'm just going to let the ruling be the ruling and we're going to move on from there. Um, but I think that has tainted you know, her, her candidacy and, uh, she has to deal with that. Do you think she should stay in the race? Um, I, she can do whatever she wants. Got it. And moving forward, if there's going to be any positive out of the story is the legislation that secretary of state, Greg Amore is introducing next session, which if I'm not sure if you read that announcement or that statement, yep. but to my understanding, based on what it said was if there's going to, if there's any fraud suspected by a city or town, in the signature process, it would kick in an automatic review. Uh, initially, do you have any support or stance on that kind of legislation? Well, I mean, I, it would be nice to have some rules. And unfortunately, the rules have to come about because of, quote unquote, illegal illegal actions or unfortunate situations, however you want to term them. Uh, but to have some some more rules in place would be would be uh, would be great. Got it. My final question is on the non-political end. I always like to ask this one at the end to keep the tradition going. In your opinion, what do you think Rhode Island is best known for? Uh, I think that Rhode Island is known for a few different things, but uh, most importantly, Rhode Island has some of the most beautiful uh, oceanfront landscapes and, and businesses. We've got wonderful restaurants. Uh, we've got a strong business community as well. So I think that, you know, we've got all of these things. Um, I don't think you can pin it down to just one. I agree with you on that. We're known for a lot of things and even more than more than just those things, Dell's coffee milk, family guy. There's so many things that uh, it really <laughs> makes this state a wonderful place to be in. That was all the questions I had rep. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Ray. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And thank you for watching this episode of reality TV. If you want to see future episodes, as soon as they're posted on this channel, please click the subscribe button down below and the post notification bell icon to the right of it. I'm Raymond Bakari and I'll see you next time.